اوكي خلاص دكتور مجدي يو كان ستارت بليز ذا مايك ويز يو بليز ذا سيشن جاست ا سكند جاست ا سكند بيكوز اي كان يو هير مي ناو نو وي كان نوت يس يس وي كان هير يو دكتور يو كان جو اهيد بليز using the airpods to to filter the voice if not i will i will cancel the airpods can you hear me now we can hear you doctor uh, majdi you can start please okay um do we have dr amin with us dr fahd is not there yet right uh, i'm here now inshallah i'm okay. joining okay. i'm joined okay uh thank you dr muhammad for the kind invitation for the kasmi uh, international meeting uh, today i have the pleasure to uh, moderate the imaging session Uh, which will uh, be presented by Dr. Fahd Kohail from Moorfield Eye Hospital, uh, United Arab Emirates, Dr. Amir Marashi from Syria, me, myself, Magdi Musa from Egypt, and Dr. Patricio from Spain, and I think he will join us soon if he's not joining us already. Um, shall we start by the first presentation, please? Okay, oh, I think I am the Amin, first presenter. Yes. Yes, please. See my screen right now? Yes, we can see it. It's good. Okay, very nice. I will start. Uh, my presentation is not long. It's uh, relatively short. It's not a mystery. It's more like an interesting case. Uh, it's a 67 years old uh, fake lady known to be hypertensive. Uh, uh and uh her uh, intraocular pressure is uh, in both eyes uh, 17 her uh, best corrected visual acuity in the right eye is a counting fingers in the other eye is hand motion and this segment are remarkable for both eyes however the fantasy examination on the uh right eye i can uh, i saw an old laser burns along the inferior retinal vein that is be dilated with blunt foveal reflex. The left eye shows thinning of both retinal arteries and retinal tissue at the macular area looks relatively thin. Patients uh, reports history of uh, retinal vein occlusion in right eye and being treated with a laser one years one year ago. But uh, the other eye which is the left eye she said that she's been diagnosed by retinal artery occlusion so by looking at the fundus scene and geogram we can see how the right eye we have a slight a delayed venous filling in the inferior arcade uh, with the laser marks and leakage at the area of the macula with small window defect however the left eye shows us um, only uh, ischemic changes and non-perfusion at the center of the macula. So when looking at the uh, OCT, we can see the right eye uh, shows a lamellar uh, hole that with the uh, interretinal cystic changes that simulates somehow a burst of a, retin uh, of a retinal cyst uh, uh, that being not treated adequately. On the other hand, the other eye shows us a thinning of the inner retinal uh, layers, which makes sense uh, with the uh, uh, the uh, fundus crescent and geography, the ischemic uh, macula. So after consulting the patient of uh, a possible treatment, I offered her to do a supracoidal injection of triamcinolone because simply I was a bit afraid of interfering with the uh, vitreal uh, macular interface because of this uh, ruptured uh, uh, cyst. So I told her, let's go for uh, the supracoidal triamcinolone and let's see the results. Well, this is eight weeks post the injection. The vision has improved to uh, 2100. Uh, then uh, after uh, 16 weeks, uh, there was a, a small cyst developing, but no changes on the, uh, uh, on the best corrected visual acuity. So I didn't treat the same after 20 weeks. 
uh, this is still uh, there. No uh, sig uh, no sig no changes uh, on the vision. However, at the thirty uh, two weeks uh, post injection, she came with reduced vision to twenty three hundred and. There was again uh, uh, cystoid macular edema, but please, uh, if you pay attention, you will see that the uh, OCT scan has reduced in quality. Thus, because the patient developed uh, developed a posterior subcapsular cataract. This is uh, eight weeks after the injection. Uh, and you can uh, see not only there was uh, the uh, lamellar hole, there was a small areas of photoreceptor uh, uh, defects uh, as uh, presented here and here. So uh, the results of treatment and follow-up were improved of vision because she restored the vision of 2100 after the second injection. No intraocular uh, pressure uh, spikes was registered during follow-up and the, there was a formation of posterior subcapsular cataract. So my take-home message is laminar hole can be due to neglected cystoid macular edema uh, treatment. We all know that, but we always uh, uh, form our thinking toward a tractionary, uh, tra a tangential traction or degenerative uh, reasons. But uh, the neglected cystoid macular edema can uh, form this burst cyst. The treatment attempts can be tried after patient consultation as this patient has improved vision from uh, counting figures uh, to 20, uh, 100. The supracorridor route can be promising um, route of treatment, and it, it it won't let us uh, worry about the interfering with the vitromacular interface. The supracorridor injection here helped to resolve the cyst and can be repeated safely. Still, cataracts and increased intraocular pressure should be kept in mind, but they are more in a predictable manner. Now, I just want to ask the panel here their opinion about the real pathology of the underlying the left eye. Is it retinal artery occlusion? Personally, I think the patient uh, is uh, only a, an old ischemic retinal vein occlusion. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Amin, for the nice uh, case. Um, so your your um, message is you can use a trimethylone supracoroidal in cases with uh, lamellar macular hole, just in case if you use anti it might increase the traction. But in this case, your diagnosis was the um, lamellar hole with a rupture cyst or due to epiretinal membrane? No, uh, due to rupture cyst. Rupture cyst. So if it's a rupture cyst, is it still safe to use anti or it's better to use uh, steroids? Uh, for, me, I, for me, I was afraid. But uh, I think uh, it, 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 the supracorridal route showed us that it was an effective and safe uh, method. But I it, personally, I don't have an experience with a burst cyst and uh, you, uh, the usage of anti-VGF. Yes, I, I, I have um, some kind of experience when cases doesn't really show an epiretinal membrane or any traction. Intrabital anti-VGF is not uh, contraindicated, but once we can see that, the, cyst, the hole is due to tangential traction. This is very uh, unusual to use uh, anti -vegif. But still, anti can do some of the, uh, you know, improvement as you showed us with the trimethylone. The problem is with trimethylone is you develop cataract as you showed us, and sooner or later she will need a cataract uh, extraction. But again, the message is good. If you are, I mean, not sure of the diagnosis, if there is any apparatal membrane, we should start using uh, trimethylone. And the other eye, you said yes. it's a central retinal vein occlusion, ischemic type. But again, if it's a ischemic type, would it be hand motion? You said hand motion in the other eye, right? Yes, yes. Because the macula is It's very thin. I've seen that. It's very thin. It could be combined artery and vein because hand motion is a very, very low vision. Even in ischemic artery, mm -hmm. sometimes you get counting fingers. Sometimes you still end up with a counting finger. But anyhow, it sounds like a the vascular element or the ischemic element in this case is very, very high. So it's a good choice to use trimethylone and prepare the patient for the complication like cataract, which can be done later on. Thank you so much, Dr. Amin, for this nice case. Any question from Dr. Fahd or any of the uh, uh, panelists? No, just if, if um, Dr. Amin could let us know how he goes about 
um, making the needle for the supercoroidal. People want to consider it. It's it's very easy. It's uh, just uh, you can do what method you want. Uh, the principle only uh, letting one thousand microns of the thirty gauge needle out uh, from the uh, uh, out and be utilized for injection. I developed my own stopper. It's a combined from the uh, rubber uh, of the uh, blunger of the uh, insulin injector and the head of the lower lip. So I combined them uh, together and I just uh, uh, insert the uh, needle, letting only 1000 micron out. I remove it. Then I, uh, after sterilizing it with the steam, I inject, then I remove the 30 gauge needle. I insert another one. Then I send it again back to the uh, steam sterilization and I can use it as a fresh. If you are interested, I can send you a full video how to manufacture it on WhatsApp later. If, uh, I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Okay, you're most welcome. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amin, again for the uh, this uh, case presentation with a very good message. Uh, shall we move to the next presentation? Uh, Dr. Fahd Kohil from Morphe Dye Hospital, United Arab Emirates. Please, Dr. Fahd. I can't hear you, Dr. Fat. Can you hear me? So, I mean, can you hear Dr. Fat? Uh, sorry, uh, can, can, you, can, you, can you hear me now? Yes, now I can hear. I do apologize. So, I'll start the presentation again. Please, um, please. This is an interesting case uh, that I came across when I was back in the UK. A 37 year old female who presented with a two to three month history of persistent photopsia within the infranasal field of the left eye with associated unilateral uh, nyptilopia. So she volunteered all this herself with a previous history of blunt ocular trauma in the left eye 18 to 19 years earlier. She was otherwise fit and well with no other relevant ocular history. And as you can see, the fundus looks to be pretty normal except in the supertemporal area. You can see there's a significant area of chororetinal atrophy. And this is where she was saying that she was experiencing the flashing lights. Uh, the right eye was healthy. And this is a Goldman visual field. So the right eye was full. But the left eye had this area of infranasal uh, scotoma, which kind of corresponds with the supertemporal uh, change in her left eye. And this was her uh, electrophysiology. So this was the electrophysiology from the right eye. And, um, so on the right, on the left hand side of the screen, is the right side traces and the left on the right side are the left eye traces. So on the right side, you've got normal A wave and B wave, but on the left side, you've got a reduced B wave, which kind of gives you, so the photoreceptors are okay, but there's a problem with the transmission of information across the inner retina. And then when you, in, in the bright flash ERG, again, on the right hand side is, oh, sorry, on the left hand side is the right eye. So the A wave and B wave is intact. But on the left eye, the photoreceptors are okay. But again, the B wave amplitude is slightly reduced, which means there's an issue with the inner retinal transmission. So it suggests that there is some form of retinopathy in that left eye, even though the um, biomicroscopy looks to be normal, the color, the color fundus looks to be normal, apart from the scar in the supertemporal area. However, the patient was complaining of flashing lights. So how am I going to identify the problem? And again, uh, you know, the patient had uh, the lights adapted ERGs. Again, there was a slight increase in the amplitude. The pattern ERG was normal, which is to be expected. So you have somebody complaining of symptoms in the left eye. Their protopsia, so sounds retinal. There is a rod cone dysfunction 
in the left eye, but no evidence of maculopathy with the normal pattern ERG. OCT was normal. So what's helped us, uh, and then we did an OCT through this area of scarring, and as you can see, the retina is very, very thin. But what helped us really crack the diagnosis about what may be going on with this patient was the autofluorescence. So when you start capturing the autofluorescence, you start noticing that there's increased autofluorescence in the supertemporal area. And that's because the retina in this area has lost some of the pigments. So you're getting increased transmission of the RPE uh, autofluorescence. And as you can see, that air increased autofluorescence extends all the way to where the scar was. And so therefore, there is some kind of focal retinopathy there that's extending towards the scar, which is not evident in her right eye with normal autofluorescence. So we concluded that this was actually some form of autoimmune retinopathy. For whatever reason, it took 20 years to manifest. And, you know, so, you know, and, and that blunt trauma was so severe that it led to chororetinal atrophy. But for some reason, 20 years later, she manifested with symptoms of an autoimmune retinopathy. But because the visual field defect was stable, because it was just symptoms of flashing lights that would be self-limiting and resolved, we didn't offer any treatment because we didn't think there was any threat to a vision function. Um, however, if it was progressive, you know, I may have considered systemic immunosuppression, immunosuppression in this case, um, but the patient is still aware of uh, nyctalopia. And then uh, this is, you know, once the flashing light settled down, we repeated the autopressence in that area. And as you can see, the, the autopressence is, is normalized. So the reason why I just shared this case, because I think it's kind of an interesting, um, it's an interesting um, autofluorescent sign. I'm just wondering whether, Magdi, you had seen this in some cases of autoimmune retinopathy. And really, autofluorescence for me was what cracked the case. In, so so we, you know, we, we knew the symptoms was retinopathy. We could see evidence of OCT damage. We saw the visual field loss. But what really helped us pinpoint that this was retinal was the autofluorescence. So we didn't feel like we need to start investigating with a CT scan or an MRI to exclude a space occupying lesion. I felt you know, it was a nice, elegant way of really localizing the problem to the retina. So we didn't have to start thinking about neurological causes for this case. Okay, we didn't treat it, but it was a very interesting autofluorescent sign. Thank you, Dr. Fahd, for this nice case. Uh, let me chat with you. I like the case. I mean, fundus autofluorescence is one of the easy, simple, non-invasive way of detecting mm -hmm. many lesions in, and it's a, I consider it the forgotten frontier. Sometimes we forget about fundus autofluorescence and we are up to do fluorescein, OCT, fundus examination, color and everything, and we forget about fundus autofluorescence. But let me ask you, if it's an autoimmune disease, would it be only unilateral? Yeah, uh, so if in, in this particular situation, my, my, my thoughts were, for whatever reason, because you had trauma in that eye many, many yes, years ago. Yes, yes. And for whatever reason, she became sensitized to it, but just in that area. What caused it? What triggered it? I have no idea. But it was really bothering to her, and it was always bothersome. So she'd come into our eye emergency department because these flashing lights were absolutely persistent. Um, and the, and the autofluorescence would only appear when she had an episode of flashing lights. And then it would subside. And then a few months later, it would recur again. And because it became frequent, I was wondering whether we, we need to consider systemic immunosuppression. But because the visual field defect didn't get worse, her ERG didn't get worse. In the end, I just said, look, it's annoying. Um, yes, I could give you steroids. But with all these things, it's a risk benefit uh, yes. decision, isn't it? And if it's just annoying flashing lights, which, which, which are self-limiting, but that's why I, th I thought it was autoimmune. But I think what would have pinched it is if I'd given a steroid challenge and it com completely settled it, then I could be confident this is autoimmune mechanism. But that was my suspicion. Yep. Can you think of any other mechanism? Can you think of any other mechanism? Let, let, let me chat with you. I like the case. I like the case very much. And I'm still, I'm still you know, brainstorming with myself while you are speaking. I like the case. Uh, let me ask you. We, we consider flashes of light 
uh, uh, I mean, traction on the photoreceptor, right? This is the explanation yes. of photopsy, right? Yes. So in, in this case, there is no vitreal element. There is no vitreal retinal traction of any kind, right? There was no. Yes, one. correct. And her flashing lights were not like the PVD flashing light. It's it the is? starry, it's more of a starry flashing light that you I get see. with bird shots or you get with... Yes, so it was, yes. It was more of a... This is, um, this is my question. This is my question yeah. because... Photopsia or flashes of light is completely different from what you're seeing. It's look, it looks like the migraine one. I mean, like it could be uh, like bright light, like, you know, annoying light, like photopsia due to severe light stimulation. It could be. But I think, in my opinion, I think trauma has triggered this because in the lesion, in the peripheral lesion you showed us, there is atrophy and hypertrophy. So it means there is RPE migration could be RPE moving into the circulation. It could be sensitization to the RPE because it's a extensive mottling. It's not only atrophy. It is the trauma which causes migration of the RPE and this migration of the RPE can pass to the circulation. It might irritate the uh, or start the autoimmune process. So the trauma has triggered this probably. And it could be due to the trauma itself migrating the RPE, causing sensitization to the RPE, attacking the normal RPE in the same eye. It could be. Yes. And, and it's a kind of a very mild, mild form of sympathetic. But thankfully, yeah. you know, never yes. quite got to the point yes. where she gets significant inflammation that you need to intervene. But, you know, at one point I was, I was battling because she was really annoyed by, the, by it. But I, I'm grateful that I, ca not calmed down, but because I, I wasn't sure about the risk-benefit ratio, risk-benefit um, analysis for her, I actually got a second opinion with one of my other UV artist colleagues, and he, he was very clear, look, it's annoying, but there's no loss of function. There's no progressive loss of function. So, you know, the, the, the side effects of the immunosuppression is far greater than the side effects of the disease. And I think that's a good way, whenever you're making a decision about treating any disease, you know, yes. what is the risk of observation versus the risk of treatment? And if, if the risk of treatment is greater than the risk of observation, which is like, sure, in this case, sure and uh, better to leave her alone and just reassure her that it will be self-limiting. And just fascinating that when the flashing light stopped, the autopressence normalized. And when this the flashing lights recur, and when the flashing lights recur, she would get this, bleep, this, this um, hyperpressive pattern. And um, I, I was quite puzzled about the mechanism. So I actually discussed it with um, Giovanni Serenghi at one of the meetings a few years ago. And he, his feeling was, because you've got in photoreceptor activation or whatever, it's, you're reducing the level of pigments in the level of the photoreceptor, so you're allowing greater transmission of the RPE fluorescence. Yes. And then it, yes. But who knows? Who knows? A fascinating, yes. fascinating case, and uh, it's the one and only for me. I've seen many cases go to immune retinopathy, but um, only one of these cases with this very interesting autofluorescence pattern. Yeah, it's... A it's another explanation of uh, the stressed RPE because hyper autofluorescence means stressed RPE. It is not dead. Yes. It is not atrophic. Yes. It is stressed. So it means that the, the, what, whatever the trigger is, it stressed the RPE, it causes irritation to the photoreceptor maybe, and then the stressed RPE release uh, is relieved. And that's why the fundus autofluorescence return to normal and the photopsia is gone. That's a good one. That's a very good one. And very good brainstorming, thinking how pathology can happen and sometimes it happens and it stops uh, uh, spontaneously. So no need to treat or hurry to treat and follow up is one of the most important things in, you know, relieving the patient and assuring the patient. And, and sorry, one more thing there, Professor Matt Musa. I think for me, it was just the fact that I could do all the investigations and absolutely localize the retinal uh, location for the problem. So I never ever requested neuroimaging for her. Whilst, you know, you can see um, other specialists being quite nervous about a unilateral nerve, you know, infranasal defect. Um, and, and it's just, yeah, it's just the beauty of autopressants that really helps you say, yes, this is retinal and, and nothing else. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. And non-invasive and uh, follow up, that's, that's the regimen for this case. Thank you, Dr. Pat. Thank you so much. No, it's my um, pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if Dr. Patricio is here or not. I am, he, I am. He here? I'm here. Oh, you are here. Musa. Long time no see. You, you yes. are coming late. Why? Why? What are you doing in Spain? I, I don't know. Just having some uh, some relaxing time here, but um, okay. I I was not able to get through the through the Zoom link, but finally I'm here. Yeah, with all of you. Thank you so much.
Um, okay, thank you, and uh, nice to see you again. And uh, you. and uh, I hope you you enjoying going back to your country. And uh, yes. we are going to enjoy your case today. Please yes. go ahead. Okay. So thank you, Dr. Alambri, Professor Musa, and all my esteemed colleagues, and all the attendees for having me here today. I am going to present a case of a choroidal lesion. I want to thank my colleague, Carmen Navarro, for helping me out with this presentation too. And let's go ahead then. So this was a, a, a scared 47 years old female who had attended previously a facility outside of the country in 2017 and also attended recently a local clinic where she was advised to take intravitreal injections for her left eye. Um, the patient presented to me with some old OCT images. So we can see here that the right eye is pretty normal, looks fine, and the left eye is pretty bizarre with something like a hollow macula, uh, I don't know, outer layers, uh, destruction, or we'll see. This is another of the images she had. I'm uh, not sure if we, yeah, is this is retinal fluid here. Maybe, not so sure. Um, more images that she brought to, to me. So on examination, she had no complaints uh, and she came for a second opinion. Her best visual corrected uh, acuity was 100% in her right eye and 0.15 in her left eye. And she said that she was like yeah. that for years. She also had a mild nuclear sclerosis in the left eye. The right eye was within normal limits for the fundus. And then the left eye presented an orange central lesion with central retinal scar. She had no previous history of eye trauma or eye surgery. So we did for her color picture, OCT, OCTA and fundus uh, and fluorescent ge and geography. So we can see here a well demarcated orange lesion um, right up to the limit of the foveola, involving the foveola. And if you pay attention, you we can see here something like a three arms star, which is just a central fibrosis. Uh, for the OCT, we, we can see thinning of the central retina with photoreceptor loss subretinal fibrosis, and the lesion has areas of hypofluorescence and hyperfluorescence, hyper, sorry, hyperreflectivity, and this area of choroidal excavation. The OCTA shows an irregular vascular ne network between the RPE and the choroid. You can see here the, the, the branches of the, of the capillaries. This is a mix of the OCT and the uh, fluorescent angiography. We can see here this peak, which is the fibrosis through the center. Again, the fibrosis, some empty spaces, but not real subretinal fluid. And this is the fluorescent angiography uh, in the beginning at the 20 seconds with showing early hyperfluorescence. And then after six minutes, we see that there is only a staining, but not leakage. So at this time, and with all this information, what could be your recommendation for this patient? You would go ahead as previously advised for with intravitreal anti-VGF. Um, maybe you're thinking of PDT, just observation, or I don't know, I'm going to refer the case. So finally, did you make up your mind and you think, what, what do you think we are dealing with here? So the patient is under observation at the moment for choroidal osteoma with no active CMV. Conclusions, a second opinion is good for some special mystery cases. Uh, we don't know everything. And then we have several agreement possibilities. We all agree and we are right, so everybody happy. We disagree, but at least one of us is right. Or we are all wrong, either agreeing or disagreeing, which is the worst case scenario for the patient. Uh, references, and um, thank you so much. Thank you, Patricia. It's a, it's a very nice case. 
Thank and, you. Uh, and uh, you didn't uh, go through the OCT. I like the OCT images, and I was going to say it could be an osteoma because it's it's a long-standing lesion. It is not a new osteoma because in osteoma we should see in the color picture the you know the yellowish or grayish elevated mass, choroidal mass elevating the retina. But this patient has a very long standing lesion. And if you can go back to the OCT, can you show us the OCT? You have multiple line scans, which is very yeah. good. Can you show us one of them? To highlight this, yes, yes. This is a very good one. It's, it shows the um, you know, long standing osteoma can cause a rarefaction in the retina and the choroid. Why? Because of the osseous bone is absorbed by the time and you find cavitation in the choroid, huge cavitation. As you can see here, there's almost eaten up. All the choroid is eaten up and this is the residual degenerative cyst and the calcification. But again, it's a very nice case and there's a choroidal excavation too. So it means it's a very long standing lesion with a lot of degenerative cyst because of the choroid is already eaten up by the osteoma. And there is rarification and decalcification. And that's why you have a very thick choroid, but there is nothing in there except the residual osseous uh, or bone formation. So this is a very nice illustrating, but I have a case like this. I followed up for 10 years and I found, at, found out after a few years, the calcification, is, is, the calcification started to resolve. There is no osseous, there's no bone anymore. And sometimes you find a very, very thick choroid and hollow, there is nothing in there. And this is another point. I have, a, my case had a CMV and I injected her twice. And after that, OCT angel was the only clue that there was a CMV there. And she was treated in US by a couple of injections. She came back to Egypt. I gave her another couple of injection. And after that, she's stable for years. Thank you for illustrating this case. And again, it's a very nice to have a, you know, variety of cases, but this is a long standing osteoma. Yeah and it sounds yeah. very, very nice case. Definitely. Most, most osteomas starts at the late teens or early twenties. Yes. So this yes. is probably a 20 years plus uh, osteoma. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any question, Dr. Fat or Dr. Amin, on this nice case? No, any just no a one question for Patricio. Whether you would have done an ultrasound um, as well, I don't, I don't, rem I don't remember whether you did that um, as part of your workup, or maybe a CT scan. Sometimes I think they're very, particularly when they're quite advanced like this, and atrophic. Sometimes it's difficult to, to um, yeah. be sure. You 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 can do several things. The easiest one is to do just a plain X-ray where yep. you can see the, the calcification. But if you want to go for an A scan, you will see a, a spike. And yep. if you want to go for, for a, for a B-scan, you will see something like a hyporeflectivity there, an elevated uh, region. Um, it all helps, but in this case, the, for example, for the CT scan, again, a CT scan, you can see, you can see the, the, the calcium in the eye. And for the MRI, it's a hypo intense in both T1 and T2. Um, but I mean, I, I don't think you really need to go into, uh, let's say, brain imaging for diagnosing osteoma. I don't know what the, the other members of the panel think, but I usually don't, don't request neither CT nor MRI. Uh, and the B-scan, yeah, it's helpful, but I think that just a plain X-ray uh, will show the calcification. Or ultrasound, like as you said. Ultrasound is yeah. in our field. It's, mm. it's to confirm the diagnosis, to confirm the presence of osteoma. You will have a remnant. You will have a spike on the A-scan, and you can see it, I think, probably in this area. But I like the plain X-ray. That's, that's a good tip. I will try that the next time I see you. That's a good tip. Cheap, <laughs> cheap, cheap and fast. <laughs> yeah. Thank, thank you, Patricio. Any, any question, Dr. Amin? No, I don't have any questions. Thank you very okay. much for the wonderful case. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Patricio. And I'm glad to see you again. And uh, I think the floor is mine now. I will share my screen. Please uh, pay attention to my case. because so, uh, I think you can see my screen now, right? Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, Professor. OK. So. This is a case I presented almost 10 years ago. And I repeated some of the OCT when I had this website. That was 2013, almost 10 years ago. 
I had a child, it's a couple of cases, but this is to give the message. I have a child with multiple methods in both eyes. He's an eight years old boy. His left eye is a 636, discovered accidentally during routine examination at school. They send him why his vision is low in this eye. Right eye 66 and no error of refraction, no systemic illness, anterior segment was unremarkable, and he has bilateral intraretinal mass lesions in both eyes. And here is the right eye, as you can see, and the left eye, there is a one lesion here in the center and one lesion on the periphery. Let me magnify the right eye. This is a mass lesion, intraretinal and probably protruding over the retina. And there's another mass lesion up there beyond the arcades. And again, it's a yellowish mesh lesion, well circumscribed. And this is the left eye. There's a yellowish circular lesion, looks like an RP atrophy, which is not, and we will show you in a minute. And this is another tiny peripheral lesion, again, beyond the superior arcade. So when I looked at the child and asked his mother about any history, nothing, it was full term, had nothing at the early childhood, no history of trauma. And I looked at him and I said, what is going on? So I did, that's a spectral domain OCT at that time. And this is the lesion. It's intraretinal protruding over the surface of the retina. But again, it is included inside the retina because you can see the retinal internal limiting mirror over the lesion. It's a very hyperreflective lesion and shadowing the underlying structure. We don't see much of the RPE or the outer retinal layers because of the shadowing. And this is the lesion. And this is a horizontal line scan through the macula. It sounds okay. But again, it's at the upper end of the lesion, this one. And this one is passing through the lesion. Again, there's a thick epiretinal fibrosis and a very dense hyperreflective intraretinal lesion shadowing what's underlying. And I did swept source OCT at that time. I had a trial for a prototype of swept source, 2013. It looks homogeneous hyperreflective lesion occupying all the retina. And there is hyperreflectivity over the surface, which looks like a thick epiretinal hyperreflectivity uh, or hyper or membrane. And this is, again, macula is free in both eyes. And this is the lesion beyond the arcades. Look at this lesion. Multiple hyper hyperreflective cystic changes inside the lesion, small and large ones and multiple hyperreflective dots or fusite looks like calcification. And this is the lesion. And this is, as I said, intraretinal mass with loss of anatomy. There is this organization. There is no differentiation of the retinal layers in this area. And it looks like a moth-eaten empty spaces presenting intraretinal calcification, also the hyperreflective lesions. And shadowing what's underlying, which means the lesion is full of hyperreflective tissue. When I looked at this boy and I said, let me go through the lesion again, magnified picture showing the calcification I'm speaking about, the hyperreflective fossil, and the degenerative or hyperreflective cyst inside the lesion. And this is the another sweat source line scan through the lesion beyond the arcades. And this is another sweat source OCT through vertical and horizontal through the peripapillary region. And as I said, it's homogenous, hyperreflective amalgamated lesion. There is no differentiation inside. There is no differentiation of the retinal layers inside this area. And this is the left eye, which was astonishing for me. Why visual impairment? The macula looks okay. It's a little bit thin, but why 636? I don't know. And I went through the eye with multiple line scans. And I magnified this to see there is mild attenuation, or what can we call rarefaction of the parafoveal IS or S or the ellipsoid. But in the fovea, it's intact. And I still cannot explain why the vision is affected in this eye. And this is what brought the patient in. Is it a long standing lesion? Is it atrophic? Though we cannot see atrophy in the RPE or thinning, but we can see there is, like, as I said, attenuation or rarefaction or thinning of the parafoveal ISOS junction. And this is the left eye, the peripheral lesion, another small, tiny, 
hyperreflective lesion occupying most of the retinal layers. Yes, protruding the, into the vitreous, but still it's intra-retinal lesion. So any of the panel want to comment on this because I'm moving. The clue of the case was the face. He had adenoma spatium in the face. So, so I'm, I'm what, thinking, um, yes. so uh, um, the, the, the retinal astrocytomas, in, I think, uh, particularly yes. with the hyperreflective lesion and the yes. um, intraretinal calcification. And yes. the adenoma sebaceum is a feature of this condition called tuberous uh, sclerosis. sclerosis. So, yes, yeah, so you'd, you'd want to do an MRI. I'm just thinking, yep. you know, with the... Do, do they resolve, uh, Professor Magdi? No. Can, can they spontaneously resolve? Could that be the no, they, they the macula, increase in the size. One? It, it could be in the macular one, but even if it's in the macula, it should left some atrophy. But I couldn't find anything to justify why the vision is dropped. Maybe the photoreceptor is affected. Maybe, but I don't know. It's minimal attenuation, which can drop the vision to 36. I don't know. It could be a macular lesion and resolve, but I haven't seen in the literature they don't resolve that rapidly. And the boy is eight years old. How long he had it and how long it takes to resolve a lesion like this. Yeah, and I'm just I, thinking, I, I'm, I'm thinking aloud. I might be wrong, but I'm just yeah. trying to think, is there, is there a particular lesion that might be paramacular? It might give you a retrograde atrophy maybe? But I'm thinking, maybe not. I, 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 looked, with it. I looked carefully, but there was nothing. It could be a paraphobia lesion and, and it caused atrophy in this area, but I couldn't. So as you said, it's, uh, the clue is the adenoma sebaceum. It's astrocytic hamartoma. It's a benign tumor developed from the neurological tissue, which is the astrocyte. And that's why it's like amalgam. It's homogenous. It's hyperreflective because it's full of astrocyte. And... It could be purely ocular, as I showed you, and the adenoma sebaceum or the, you know, this tuberous sclerosis or Bourneville disease is the clue. When you find a face like this, you should examine the eye, you should examine the brain, as I said, because there might be systemic association. And this is the typical presentation of astrocytic hamartoma, yellowish intraretinal lesion can occur in the peripheral fundus or in the peripapillary area, and are typically elevated yellowish nodular calcific. Mulberry, mulberry right lesion sometimes. Let me go through the second case to give you another message in the second case. This is a typical astrocytic hamartoma in a 15 years old female. She had chronic headache and listen, this is a neurological sign with blurring of vision and transient attack of consciousness disturbance. Vision 6-6 six, six by minus one sphere in both eyes. Slit lamp examination are remarkable and this is the fundus picture. Multiple astrocytic hamartomas yellowish, translucent, or opaque lesions that might be homogenous or might contain glistening for site calcification like the one up there. And this is, I think, a long-standing one. And this is calcified one. And this is the pleurocene. And this is the fundus autofluorescence. And this is the pleurocene and geography, early hyperfluorescence, late faint staining of these lesions. There is no leakage. They stain and sometimes it, it is due to the autofluorescence, not only the staining. And this is the central and peripheral lesion. And this is fine capillary inside network inside the lesion. And this is staining of the calcified lesions. This is the left eye, peripheral lesion. There is nothing in the center. But then I looked carefully, subtle lesions, nasal to the disc, and another lesion at the extreme nasal periphery, translucent thickening of the nerve fiber layer. And this is the calcification we see. This is from the, one of my cases when I have the stratus at that time, 2008 or 2009, hyperreflective interretinal mass with multiple cystic changes and calcification. And it's astrocytic hamartoma or retinal astrocytoma. It's derived from the retinal glial tissue, as I said, and it's called astrocytic hamartoma or slowly growing neuroplasm astrocytoma. Both appear white mulberry shape masses when multifocal and bilateral sometimes and isolated tumor in some syndrome. And this is my patient. Look at the extensive tuberous sclerosis. And that's why we have to consult neurology, dermatology, nephrology, and cardiac because multiple lesions could be there all over the body. And this is what happened in this case. She had sub and cortical lesions. That's why she had 
disturbance in the consciousness, severe headache sometimes, and this is renal angiolipoma. They call it angiolipoma. They are coincident lesion with the astrocytic hamartoma. And as I said, cutaneous adenoma sedition, depigmented macules, as we can see here, and cafe au lait patches. We have to check the skin, and this patient had one cafe au lait patch in her back. So again, this is a multi center system uh, affection, and it, the headache was the only annoying thing. She was not complaining of her vision, six, six vision. And I mean, coincidentally, I found that in the fundus, and this is what we call tuberous sclerosis, and this is what we call bone veal syndrome, retinal astrocytic hamartoma, cutaneous lesion, adenoma species, species, CNS astrocytoma, and internal tumor could be cardiac rhabdomyoma, could be renal angiomyolipoma like our case, could be pleural cyst, could be hamartoma in other organs like the liver or the thyroid. So it could be a fatal disease if we did not do a very well systemic workup. And my take home message, astrocytic hamartoma is a congenital, benign glial tumor of the sensory retina occurring as a part of tuberous sclerosis sometimes as we have seen. And the great majority of retinal astrocytic hamartoma are asymptomatic non-progressive, sometimes they discovered accidentally, and sometimes through the neurological examination, they send us the patient for fundus examination because they already diagnosed bone vein disease. And the systemic evaluation is very important because the CNS uh, manifestation or the CNS lesions sometimes is there. And no ophthalmological treatment is required for these cases. An ocular examination should be performed yearly in a patient follow-up for other manifestation of tuberous sclerosis and if any other complications happen. Thank you so much for your listen. I'm open for any question. Yeah, when, when you see one of these child, the children, um, what's your differential diagnosis uh, to make up our mind? Neurofibromatosis is my first uh, differential diagnosis, like hamartoma of the retina, retinal dignity this is one of the most important thing. Other thing is um, uh, retinal nerve fiber layer infarction. Um, myelinated nerve fiber should be in the differential diagnosis because it's a yellowish lesion. It's in the superficial layers. Yes, sometimes it stays there. But again, neurofibromatosis is one of the most important differential diagnoses. And it also happened to have a cafe au lait patches and hamartoma of the retinal or retinal pigment epithelia. And I can't think of anything else, but this is the most important differential diagnosis. Sometimes retinoblastoma should be differentiated because we should not wait to prove that it's a retinoblastoma, but retinoblastoma comes in a younger age, cannot be that multiple and solitary or small lesions. Sometimes if it's a one lesion, it's huge. If it's a multiple lesions, the retina will be affected earlier than this and the patient will come rapidly for that, especially if they have a past history of retinoblastoma in the family. So again, retinoblastoma is one of the differential, neurofibromatosis, uh, myelinated nerve fibers, and these are the most important differential diagnosis if I'm not forgetting anything. Yes, thank you. No, I was thinking that I've seen many children with uh, bone marrow transplants. And um, for these children, I would think also maybe of ruling out uh, lymphoma. Sure, sure. But lymphoma, as, as you, you see a lot of patients, it has to be with a sort of vitritis or inflammation or uveitis. I mean, it doesn't come that uh, quiescent eye. But again, it's in the differential, as you said. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, Dr. Fahd or Dr. Amin, before we uh, conclude this session? We are five minutes ahead of the, though we started 10 minutes late, but I'm glad that we didn't, uh, you know, spend more time. Any questions? What do you want to uh -huh. conclude? I conclude. Uh, no questions from me, Professor Mike. No thank questions you, from my side. Thank you, Dr. Amin. Uh, let me conclude this session and thank Dr. Al Amri and Dr. Fatma from Kasmi Hospital for their kind invitation for us to share. And uh, I'm, I'm inviting you tomorrow. We have a, another uh, uh, white field imaging session tomorrow at the same time, almost tomorrow, seven o'clock in the evening, uh, eight o'clock MRS time. And uh, I'm asking all the participants to be in Hall A now because there is a keynote lecture. Dr. Al Amri didn't give me that time. He popped up with uh, his picture now and he's uh, smiling at us and he's checking that we are on time. You, you have five more minutes. Yeah, I mean, you can speak in this five minutes before the next lecture. Thank you again, Dr. Al Amri, for kind invitation. 
And thank you, my participant, Dr. Amin, Dr. Pat, Dr. Patricio, and hope to see you again soon. Uh, thank, thank you, you Professor Thank you, thank you. Dr. Majdi, thank you very much, Dr. Patricio, Dr. Fahad, and Dr. Amin for this very interesting session and on time even less. Thank you very much. This is one amazing, the most amazing session as usual. Thank you. You can stay with us, Dr. Majdi here also. It will be great to have you also. We will have Thank Dr. Ahal as a guest of honor today, a speaker. Dinner will be served or not? Sorry? Yeah, it will be in through the Zoom. Sure. There is no dinner, dinner through the Zoom. Thank you so much. It's very tasty. Yeah. Everything like. <laughs> okay, we will give another few minutes because still we are having a time. Uh, if anyone wants to take a rest and come back, it's okay because we are having another session not yet finished. So we will wait for them to finish and uh, attendees, they can join, join us in this session. Uh, this is the last session and the only session uh, at the same time. There is no two sessions at the same time, only one session. Uh, so to have um, or to enjoy Dr. Rahala's uh, presentation uh, as a guest of honor for the uh, Thursday of quick conference. Okay, we'll uh, take a break five minutes and come back. Thank you, Dr. Rahala. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rahala.